Um, so here's where we start. Well, I think, yeah, let's take it away. Let's, let's get this uh, Let's, let's get start this it. Started. OK. Welcome, Penny, to Korea Thank Black. You. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's a hell of an introduction, wasn't it? <laughs> OK, first and foremost, I want to just say Thank you to Creative Live. It is like a serious honor. It really was. When you guys called me, when Craig called me, I was just like, wow, this is cool. I never in my wildest dreams would have ever thought, you know, about doing something like this. Who would? But I'm glad I did. And it's an incredible honor. And the photographers that, the caliber of photographers that they bring in for me was just like totally, it was a no brainer. Some really good photographers. And to have my name, you know, stand alongside theirs, I was like, that, that's an honor. So, so I want to say thanks to Creative Live. Um, and any time I, uh, any time I have an opportunity to, to show my photographs, it's always, uh, it's always an honor, but even more than that, it's a truly humbling experience for me, because uh, th these are, for me, making pictures is a, a real journey. Um, and so I'm really, I'm really humbled to show you my pictures today. <clears throat> and I also feel like, I feel like it's important for me to, uh, to tell you my point of departure into photography so that you can understand the way that I make pictures today. I think that's really important. So uh, I'm going to spend a little, a little time this morning kind of showing you some pictures of where I started. Um, because the way I make pictures today is, stems from where I started. It, it affects the way I approach subjects. It affects the way I um, photograph subjects. It affects the way my, my evolution in seeing a subject is affected by how I started in photography. Um, and whenever I talk about photography, it is hard for me to not talk about being, uh, feeling completely rejected. Uh, being told no, um, feeling discouraged, uh, having dreams, uh, being vulnerable, aspiring to be better, um, and, uh, and having the courage every day to keep trying. Because in a nutshell, that is photography. It is all those emotions and so much more. Um, this, <laughs> this um, career of photography has never been a career for me. It's a lifestyle. Um, and so uh, I, I have a way that I normally start a, a, a discussion like this. And I decided I just had this incredible experience in the field. And I thought that that was a little more poignant. And I'll actually get back to my other way. But we have like three days to do this. So I'm sure <laughs> there'll be a downtime where I'm like, oh, let me tell that story. <laughs> Um, I was just on an assignment uh, a month ago in Los Angeles. And I had a, my editor called me and said, hey, we're doing it. It's for Sever magazine. And uh, he called me and said, we're doing uh, an issue on barbecue. It's publishing next month. So I can tell you about it because it's already gone to press. But I can't show you pictures because I'm bound by my contract. I can't. But I'm going to tell you about this moment, not the pictures as much. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, he called me and said, it's for our feature for this big issue on barbecue. And we want you to go to LA. And um, I was like, totally, yeah, I'm there. So I left like three days later. And I got there. And I was working with this really well-known New York Times food critic, former food critic. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it was a story about this woman who makes lamb barbacoa. Do you guys know what lamb barbacoa is? It's, uh, it's a Mexican tradition. I don't know that they make it in other parts of Latin America. but. It's a way in which the lamb is made. And it's typically where I'm from, my family's from, it's, it's cow, it's beef. So this woman makes a lamb, barbacoa. And it's the process in which the lamb is cooked. So barbacoa is always dug. You dig a pit in the ground, you put hot coals, and you put the meat in it, and you cover it up. And it cooks for six hours or 10 hours, depending on how much meat. So this woman. <coughs> lives in East, East, East LA in a place called, I probably shouldn't say. <laughs> um, and uh, she's undocumented. Um, her business that she runs is an, a non-licensed restaurant that she has in her carport. On Sunday mornings, she sells barbacoa. And this is how she supports her family. 
She lives in a little ranchito, which is like a, a small house with several houses around it. So it's a yard, multiple family dwelling, basically. And so it was not, the subject was delicate. You know, me entering her life for a national publication and telling her story was scary for her because she could lose everything. Um, so there was uh, a lot of convincing and conversations. She's only Spanish speaker. So uh, I arrived on a Saturday. Uh, we were supposed to shoot Sunday. She only works on Sunday. She sells this barbacoa on Sundays. And so, of course, she, she canceled. So I, I knew that she was not comfortable with this. But this was the feature well story for this big issue. So I was like, crap. So she canceled for Sunday. So the writer and I spent like two days finding other stories as backups. You know, we shot some Greek barbecue. We went and did some carne asada in, in East LA. Um, and then we got in touch with her again. And she was like, Monday, let's do it Monday. And then she called me back and said, I can't do it Monday. And I was just like, this isn't going to happen. <laughs> this story is dead. Uh, so I called her back. And I just tried to appeal to her and said, look, this is what we're trying to do. And um, can, you know, how about tomorrow? And she's like, OK tomorrow. Be at my house at 4 a.m. It's like, yes, perfect. Uh, I always tweet about having to get up really early, and I normally do. But she was probably wanted me to be there at 10 when she'd already got the lamb in the ground and was going to like eventually serve it. But I was like, no, I want to be there. When you wake up in the morning, I want to go with you through the whole process. She actually buys the lamb live. We, go, we drove out to a ranch. So I get there at 4 a.m. We drive out to a ranch 30 miles east. So we're deep, deep. I don't even know what. We're not even in LA at this point. Um, they harvest, they, they, like the cowboy comes out, he lassos the lamb, they grab it, they harvest it. I was just like, she wasn't kidding, you know? Most people, when they say, oh, we're going to get some fresh lamb, they go to the, <laughs> the market and that's the fresh lamb. And I was like, no, this is the real deal. And the, the, the tradition in which she's making this meat, the barbacoa, is it is an art. It's something that happens in Mexico on the weekends. It's a celebratory thing. It is an artisanal, it's artisanal. You don't see it a lot in this country. So for me, I was like, oh, this is huge. She's probably in her, it's hard to say how old she was. I didn't want to ask her, but I would say she was in her late 50s, maybe even 60. So she did this whole operation by herself. We go out, she harvests the lamb. She didn't harvest the lamb, but the ranchers did, and she, uh, they harvest the lamb, they put, she puts it in the back of her truck, and we drive back to her house. And um, at that point, at 4 a.m., she had lit the fire with coals, and it had burned down. And uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail as to what she did, but she spent like two or three hours getting the lamb ready and putting it in the pit. And uh, she takes these big, um, she takes these big um, agave leaves. Actually, they're maguey leaves. They're big cactus petals. And she put them over the fire. This is her all by herself. She's sweating. <laughs> And I'm just quietly you know, making my pictures, telling the story about this woman who, this is how she supports her family. This is a food story about barbecue. And this is, I'm looking at this woman who started her day way before 4 AM and who will spend the next 12 hours making this barbacoa for me, you know, to photograph. Um, and so she puts the, the meat in the ground. She, she starts by taking the leaves and softening them. She puts it on a grate. She takes the lamb. She puts it on the leaves. Then she takes another set of leaves and softens them, puts it on the lamb. And the hole's huge, right? And she covers it up with these big metal doors. And then she takes carpets, covers it. And then she takes a bunch of um, blankets. And then she lines it with rocks so it's sealed. So this meat is steaming, basically. Um, and then it's like, I think it was like six or seven hours later. And in, in, in that time, she's like making salsas and hand making tortillas and like a group of nuns stopped by and I was like, oh my God, they weren't dressed as nuns. <laughs> they weren't dressed as nuns, I should tell you that. But they, like one of them had a great hat and I was like, oh, this is awesome. I love when those surprises happen. So I was like, oh. Um, and of course she says, come and have, come back at 3 p.m. and have barbacoa. And I was like, yes, because at that point, it was just gonna be me and the writer eating the barbacoa. And I was like, I gotta photograph this, I can't eat. Um, so like people were stopping by because they would smell the, the smoke. And so anyway, uh, she 
finishes kind of her prep and the meal's almost done and she goes and uh, the fire at that point, the lamb was pretty much ready. So she goes and takes off all the carpets and the blankets and gets the lamb out and there's like a crowd of people watching and it's like, you know, and these are all just people from the neighborhood and she, it's so much lamb that she has one of those um, igloo with a rolly, you know, and she's like rolling it, you know, so there's this funny photo of her like rolling it and the lights streaming. Um, and then, and then, so this group of people sit down and they have this meal, and it was like, I probably at this point I'd probably been with her for 12 hours, and uh, you know she'd asked me all about my life, I'd asked her all about her life. Um, we'd probably like ate a taco together. In fact, we did. I went grocery shopping with her, and she was like, "Are you hungry?" And I was like, "Yeah." So we had a taco. Anyway, so long story short, the writer and I, you know, the, the day has ended. This amazing meal, the food was beautiful. And I was left with this like, wow, this is, this is awesome. This is a food, this is, this is barbecue. This is barbecue, you know, this is, I mean, sure, barbecue is what you see in Kansas City or Texas, or, but this is really special. This is like, no one's gonna expect this. This is powerful. And so we go to say goodbye to her, um, and she looks at me, <clears throat> and uh, she starts to cry. <clears throat> she gave me a hug. <clears throat> and I realized that, that I, I, I was just kind of like emotional. I wasn't expecting her to react like that, you know? So I gave her a hug and, and said goodbye and I walked away and I was kind of like starting to cry myself and, and I looked at the writer and I was like, what was that? What was that? And she looked at me and she said, she said, and she was taken aback too, and she looked at me and she said, I was like, what just happened? And she was like, you just did your job. And I just was like, <clears throat> you know, I made that woman, not me, but the, the act of being with her and making her picture for 14 hours and celebrating what she did, what she does to support her family, her three daughters and however many, uh, other children she has that aren't living with her or sending money back to her family in Mexico, whatever it is, but we celebrated her for 12 hours. I, she probably never had her photograph made professionally, ever, 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 ever. She took a chance, trusted us, let us come into her life, let us document this lost art that she's actively doing. And I think, I, it just blew me away. It was this moment in myself where I realized, Oh my God. And that, that is so powerful. And that is exactly why I make photographs. It's that feeling right there where you realize there's a connection. And you can tell that person's story. That is powerful. That, there's, that, that is photography. That range of emotions I mentioned earlier, it, that is photography. And I was reminded of the first time I felt that, and I've been chasing that feeling, that emotion, that exchange, that connection, that vulnerability, that humility, since the first time I felt it. And so I wanted to show you that set of pictures this morning. The first time I walked into a place and felt like, oh, take my breath away, this is powerful. I have to have a camera to tell this story. So that's what we're going to look at right now. <clears throat> so uh, I was in graduate school. Um, and it was my uh, thesis project. And I'd found out about uh, uh, women in prison on the, one of the most dangerous cities in the world now. It's where the drug cartel has completely overrun the community. It's in Nuevo Laredo, Texas. Uh, and I'd found out about this prison that allowed women to keep their children with them. Um, and so I was like, that, that's an amazing story. I actually had family on the, on the US side in Laredo. Um, and uh, so I uh, carved out nine days. I gave myself nine days. I didn't have any money. <laughs> I was in graduate school. I had no money. I borrowed miles from my brother. Um, and I flew down, and I didn't have any access at this point. I had made one contact with a relative who was a lawyer. Um, 
And uh, he and I met in the morning pretty early. We went to the prison and we just like completely just went in and said, hey, can we, can I come in and make pictures? It's for, I'm a photographer. It's for a graduate thesis project. This is before this part of the world exploded with violence and drugs. This was before it was a, a threat, uh, so, sort of. Um, and they said yes. <laughs> to my surprise, they let me in. But I had borrowed access from him because he knew the warden really well. Um, and so I got in. And so it was a story about these women who are able to keep their children with them up until six years of age. Um, a lot of these children are conceived in prison. So it's a co-ed prison. I believe there were 3,500 inmates. The women were separated from the men. Um, and so like this little girl was actually conceived in prison. That's her father, and that's their relationship. He's incarcerated also. So they walk down that fence together, and that's how they spend time together. They, can, they do get visits like to be with each other, but those are limited. So I actually only got three days in the prison because it was very dangerous, and I didn't want to stay there any longer. Um, but it was, again, it was that moment. I had a lot of people when I was in prison uh, wanting to tell me their story, and of course I wanted to listen, but it was hard for me to listen and make pictures because it was really dangerous. Uh, and then after, after I did the initial body of work, I used this body of work to, uh, it, it's, it's this body of work that got me my, my big break with National Geographic. So, after, I was then sent back like a few years later to by Mother Jones Magazine to go back into the prison and do some more uh, photography on this. And I actually had a harder time the second time getting access because the drug violence had escalated. We're talking 2005. So, uh, you know, I had to, in this case it wasn't easy. I actually had a representative from the Mexican government who helped me get to the door, and he basically won the equivalent of the Pulitzer Prize in Mexico. And he was, we, we, never, we never even met the warden. They were just like, no, you can't come in here. So I was like, crap, you know, I'm on assignment now. I'm getting paid. I need to produce the story. Um, so I called a friend of mine who's a writer for Texas Monthly and has done a lot of work on the border and along specifically with the drug cartel and the, the drug violence. And um, she told me to contact, uh, the publisher of the local newspaper, and that maybe he could help me get access. And so uh, I met him. Uh, uh, he was like, meet me at 11 PM in this bar on this street. And I was like, this sounds kind of <laughs> sketchy. <laughs> the guy, yeah. So I walk in this bar, and it's all men. It's like a gambling bar. And you can see like TV screens everywhere, and they'd have like the a baseball game, uh, horse races, and I don't know what else, but they were all gambling. And he was there, really nice man. He's probably watching and going, what the hell? Um, so after like, I don't know, a couple of beers and I don't know how many shots of tequila, he was like, so why do you want to go to this prison? And I was like, well, there's this story I really want to do. I already did it and I want to go back and continue it. And this magazine put me on assignment. And he was like, I can get you in. It's like, okay, he's like, go there tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. I was like, what? So I go back to my hotel, and I'm, you know, it's, 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 a, it's really dangerous. I'm back in my hotel. There's like uh, police guards almost at every hotel. The, the drug violence has escalated. Uh, I knew, so I go, I'm just painting, I'm giving you the background here about how uh, intense it was. So I go, I go to the, Back to the prison, remember the day before, I couldn't even meet the warden, and the guy was like, sorry, you can't make any pictures. So I go back, I go back uh, at 8 a.m., and the warden's there waiting for me, and he just practically like escorts me in, and I was just like, what just happened? <laughs> Who did I make an agreement with here? So anyway, I got into the prison, I made these pictures. Actually, that guy, the one before, uh, let's see if I can get back here, yeah. Uh, that is his child. He is not incarcerated. His wife is, or his partner, girlfriend. Um, and so they actually had a conjugal visit, and they conceived the baby in prison. And so she had just given birth to the baby. They birthed the babies outside of the prison, obviously. So he was walking around with his newborn son. <clears throat> uh, so the women share cells, and 
tons of drug uh, usage. Uh, this is a conjugal visit. I actually was able to get, uh, I didn't need to see much more than this, but um, I think they paid like $5 for a conjugal visit. I can't remember, but it's totally appropriate and acceptable and it's not a big deal. But I love that you know they brought their appropriate accoutrement, the water, the cooler full of I don't know what, but anyway, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is uh, uh, one of the one of the cell blocks in one of the actual cells. Uh, three women. I just want to give you a sense of the of this situation. Um, a totally different story, but again, I'm I'm accessing those same feelings, you know, and vulnerable v vulnerabilities, and uh, really trying to uh, connect with the subject and in whatever way I can uh, be true to who they are. I, I wouldn't say I don't want to say celebrate, but I'm really trying to honor who, who they are and their story. So uh, this, this was, uh, one, one of the ladies had come up to me and said, hey, there's going to be this great picture. Do you want it? And I was like, I guess so, you know, and um, she was like, okay, it's going to be upstairs in like five minutes. They're going to take down this other woman. So there's going to be like a fight. And I just thought, what? I don't know if I want to do that. So I, I actually went up the stairs. And, uh, and I, I did a, a total about face. I got up the stairs, I saw kind of the women gathering, and I did an about face. And in my, my heart, I was like, I don't want to photograph that. I don't want to, I don't want to do that. This story is about women and children in prison. And yeah, that's an that's a, uh, element of life in the prison. But I knew that being a part of that could have compromised my access. So I was like, no, my, my gut was like, get out of there. So I didn't about face, I walked down the stairs and literally, this is what I saw. This little girl came out from around the corner and started twirling in this little toupee. And I was like, it was this amazing gift. And so it was like one of those first lessons for me that trust your instincts, you know? And I think it's easy to make the pictures that are hard. No, let me take that back. I think it's easy to make the pictures that are not easy, but you know, in a place like this, it's easy to make a picture of someone getting beat up and a downtrodden life. But the pictures where you see hope, or you see any glimpse of joy, that's the harder picture. And so it was like this, I learned that. In that time, I learned that. So uh, I started working for National Geographic, and they did a whole series on zip codes. And I don't know how many of those I did, but they did like every state in the country. And I did a ton of them. And this was one of my, the first ones I did, and it was this, um, this island that on the, in the summers, it's inhabited by all these um, campers. It's a big summer camp island. And so basically, they sent me to summer camp for like a week, which was kind of a nightmare because uh, I hated summer camp. Like, my mom forced me to go to Girl Scout camp, and I was like, damn it. Like, I didn't sell a single cookie. I was like, screw that. I'm not selling a cookie, and I'm not going. And she was like, oh, yes, you are. <laughs> you don't have to sell a cookie. <laughs> I'm paying for it. <laughs> so I was like, man. So, OK, so I go to camp. Um, it was a, that was a fun, that was a great assignment. And I, I just totally had fun with it. I, I got an I took out an underwater camera from, uh, from the geographic, and uh, I practiced my underwater photography, and so I made some pictures underwater. And then this is the photo of them leaving camp. They are so like sad. They're grasping their teddy bears, and they're like, the boat is leaving to go take them to their parents. And it's like the end of their summer, you know, back to school. Um, so for the past. I don't know where I should start counting, but I would say at least the past 10 years, I, I, I'm a true believer in personal projects. Uh, I think that you have to, I think you have to self-assign your dream assignment because I don't know that you'll ever get it. I don't know that they exist, um, but they do if you just give it to yourself. So self-assign your dream assignment. That is the best advice I can give all of you. If you want to be a great photographer, find great pictures, find great stories. Just go find them and do them. That's like 
that's like, I just gave you my secret to my career. I should just leave right now. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tweet it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, somebody will. Um, uh, are there any questions? I just because just I want to, or maybe I should just go into this, but do you guys have any questions? <clears throat> Are you there with me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Cool. So I, I, where do I start counting? I think I did this for 10 years at least, and I'm still doing it. I am obsessed with the, the borderlands of Mexico and the U.S., and I proposed to National Geographic to let me do a documentary project on it. Um, and they said, okay. And so I got their uh, photography grant, which I want to say it's $75,000. And so I stretched that money for six years. And I slept on couches. Um, I stayed with relatives. I, you know, I, I lived on that. I took assignments from other magazines. I took assignments from them. But I used that money specifically to, to fuel this project, which will be this is a personal project for me. So it's about, uh, it's about culture along the Texas-Mexico border, which are, in Texas we call them Tejanos, um, people of Mexican descent, descent who live along the border. And so um, it's really a, a story about the evolution of uh, immigration in this country. And there's a cross-section of Mexican, Mexican-Americans, undocumented people, um, Mexican nationals who are all along this border. And some of the wealthiest communities in this country are along the border, as, as well as some of the poorest. And so for me, it was like, it's a completely different culture. Um, and this young girl is a debutante. <clears throat> um, and she's getting fitted for her, uh, for her introduction into high society in this town um, where they invite uh, young girls based on their family lineage uh, and their family heritage to be inducted into high society. It's, uh, it's, it's a pretty exclusive and very expensive thing to participate in this, like crazy expensive. Uh, this is just a aerial I did of the Rio Grande, which is the big river that <coughs> separates Texas, Texas and Mexico. So I always have to give a sense of place. That's a a really important aspect of what I do. They can send, an, an, an editor or a magazine can send me anywhere in the world, but if I don't show where I'm at, I've completely failed my assignment. So a sense of place is like a key photograph, that establishing shot that sets up where you're at. That's like very important, elemental. So I spent some time with the Border Patrol. These guys are sign cutters, and they basically walk the entire desert looking for signs, as in footprints, stuff that might have fallen from people who've crossed, um, uh, who've crossed without papers. Um, I don't know the numbers, but I, I feel like the last time I checked, there's like 10,000 Border Patrol that patrol this border, just in, just in Texas. It's a, like a phenomenal amount of people. Uh, and these are day laborers. They're um, waiting for work. So I'm always looking for light, um, you know, trying to create, uh, you, always thinking about composition and, um, you know, and trying to layer my photographs. And, 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 and adding light to that kind of elevates the, the value of that photograph, the, the visual potential of it. This is a portrait I made of one of the girls who was going to be inducted into high society. I, I don't like to say how much their dresses were uh, because it's a bit of a controversy, but uh, yeah, I, I won't. I won't. Uh, so this is the, the screenshot. This is a, a photograph I made of the stage. And this is all the, the girls kind of lined up being presented during the actual uh, high society ball. Um, It's in Texas. Okay, in yeah. Texas. Okay. So it's in Texas, yeah. Are there any questions about this? Or no, but they look like dolls. Yeah. 
Is that, you know, was that sort of your intent for shooting it down totally. like that? My, I had gone back to the Geographic and we had looked at all these pictures, my editor and I, and he was like, you need a photograph that kind of gives it this space and shows uh, this idea of how vast it is. Um, and so we had talked about pulling back and maybe getting up in the rafters and making a picture that would communicate that. And we didn't anticipate it feeling so, um, like those are real people. It feels like maybe it's not, you know? And so I spent time in a lot of the colonias. Uh, colonias are undocu undocumented, um, unincorporated uh, towns along the US-Mexican border. A lot of people that live there are undocumented. Um, and many of them live without running water, electricity, sewage. And this is in the United States. So uh, I couldn't, I mean, this, this was an important element to me in, in telling this story. So this is one family just hanging out in the, late at night on their porch. I got invited to, I don't know how many like parties and you know, pachangas and fiestas. Penny, are you fluent in Spanish? Claro que sí. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> so that's helpful in these situations because they're not, these, even though they're speaking Spanish. In all yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you, you don't have to be bilingual, but I think that it's really flattering for anybody who speaks another language if you try to speak their language. Um, I mean, I didn't fit in the community just by default. I just didn't. They knew I wasn't from there. Um, I actually, this is funny, I actually ended up uh, buying a, I had, a, I had a, a nicer, not a nice car, but I had a used Volvo. And it actually ended up selling that and getting a truck when I started shooting this part of the project because if I drove up in a Volvo, which might be perceived as something, you know, a little, you know, uh, affluent. I, I just didn't want to put anybody off. So my editor was like, why don't you just buy a crusty old truck? And of course I loved that idea, so I did. <laughs> um, anyway, so what I hope you're getting in this is that like this is where I came into photography. This is where it started for me. And from here it evolved into like telling food stories. So it's not, I mean, it's not that much of a difference. Um, it's, I'm still, I'm just changing the subject, you know? It's like the center is food, but I'm still working what is around it. So these two girls are waiting for their dates. They're on their way to their quinceanera, their twin sisters. I got invited to, I don't know how many quinceaneras. I, I mean, I could do a book on quinceaneras. I actually thought about that. Maybe I should do that. I just gave my idea away. <laughs> There's quite a few people watching right now, so be careful of the ideas you give away. That's huh? okay. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm giving out my whole entire career away right here. What are we talking about? Um, so yeah, this girl is on her way to the church for her quinceanera uh, mass. Again, I'm thinking about just the moment and composition. This is like at 2 a.m. and the moms are like passed out. Their, their feet are killing them and they're just like sprawled out on the floor. Uh, this is an, uh, a, a field worker who is harvesting agaves. No, uh, aloe veras, sorry. Aloe vera plants. And this, I, I follow this woman. I was uh, spending some time in this one community, and every morning I watch this woman walk her little girls uh, to the bus. You know, it was the sweetest thing, and then she would get them on the bus, and then she would just watch them take off, and it was like, it was like they were leaving to go away for months, you know? It was the sweetest act. So here's my progression into food. Um, this was an assignment I did in, in Bahia, in um, Brazil, in Sal Salvador do Bahia. Uh, it was a story on tropical uh, fruits and uh, so I was in the market and I just waited. I framed this shot and I waited for the energy and the moment to kind of happen. And I probably, I was there with a writer and she was like, come on. And I was like, no, no, go ahead. Uh, so I'm waiting. I'm always waiting for the action to happen. And I will stay put in a place for a long time until I make a frame where I feel like I got it. And then I'll stay even longer to get it again. And then I'll stay even longer to get it again. Because it changes and it evolves. 
This was an assignment I did in Greece. Um, this, they have a day, it's called a name day. And so if your name is Christopher, then on St. Christopher Day, you go, it's like your birthday there. And so this was in the Peloponnese in a small village up on a mountain. Um, and so we went to this one particular family, one of the little girls, it was her name day. And so that was a great assignment. Uh, this is a story I did for Sever on um, Mexican food in El Paso. And so I was supposed to meet this family and they were just going to, um, I was going to photograph their food, but then when they all started to get together to sit down to eat, they were just like reaching over each other and grabbing stuff and I was like, that's the picture. And actually Sever ended up running this huge. And then the plated, the plated photograph kind of was a little smaller. but. <laughs> But this, I mean, this is, uh, this to me is food photography. This is telling a story around food, looking for a moment um, and really trying to evoke an emotion for people as they're looking at photographs. I have a question. Yeah. How much time, like, between when you submitted your story to National Geographic and they sort of brought you on board um, and then you worked for them until you went, went with Sever? Is it years? Is it? Yeah, years. I mean, I Hundreds still do of stuff for them. Dozens. Yeah, I, it's been a. I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I've worked for Sever for like six years now, so. Not much, I guess. But was it, was there a moment where, it's like okay, this is our go-to food, oh, we're so, culture versus where you were working for National Geographic? It might not for have been, me. Yes. Was there a moment where it was like, oh my God, this is where it's happening? Yeah. Yeah, there was. There was a, an amazing moment, and I will tell you that tomorrow okay. or on Sunday. Yeah, I had like an epiphany about food for sure. Uh, in the same way that I had a moment when I was, you know, with that woman with the barbacoa. Yeah, I mean, I think once I started shooting food culture, something changed for me. A lot changed for me. I feel like I opened up, and I feel like I saw the world completely differently. Um, and I realized the potential in the stories around food, and it makes perfect sense if you think about it. Because think about the industry, think about our country alone and how obsessed we are with like Top Chef and all these uh, real life kind of food shows. Um, and I mean, there's like, I don't know how many, there's like a million blogs about food. Mm -hmm. Um, we are, we, it's an art. Um, so it was like, it was, it was this perfect moment where I realized there's so much potential in telling those stories. In the same way, you know, when, when I was in the prison, I realized the potential and the power behind telling that story. In the same way with my personal project along the Texas-Mexico border and telling that story, um, food is an even bigger story because everybody relates to it around the world. Um, and it, it's, it's something that connects all of us. And it's about history and geography and culture. And, and within that itself, there are all these little fingers of amazing connection and story. It's, it's just super powerful for me. Um, yeah, I, I think that I got, I mean, when I started shooting food, that first assignment, I was in um, the first, like, you know, uh, international assignment. I was in uh, Chile, and I, literally, I had a light bulb go off in my head, and I remember calling home and going, oh my God, this is amazing. This is like amazing. I'm like, this is so cool. I'm, it was in context of like people just celebrating life, you know, and telling these really powerful, passionate stories. It was, it's ho so hard for me to articulate, but literally it, like, my heart just leapt, and I haven't looked back. I mean, food has really been this amazing journey for me, and I, I honestly feel like it, my career took off once I started shooting food. It's like I found my passion, you know? It, it just made sense. I have a question about all these pictures that you've been showing, because, a lot of them are so familiar to many of us. And it's so amazing to look at them and then realize that you were in that room. Because the idea of this being a photograph disappears, and all you see is a story. Hmm. And to see that story, I think 
almost you have to disappear to your subjects so that yeah. they can come out. But how do you, that's the, that's the big question. How do you do How that? do you disappear so that their story comes? Very well said. The internet's asking that same question. And you can, know, I, can I add to that? Because I'd just like to know, I, I know from traveling, especially in different countries, a camera is different. Yeah. It means different things in different countries, Definitely. and it's a, it's a much bigger deal in some places to have someone with a camera than it would be in the United States. Or Right, absolutely. So it intensifies it. Yeah. Uh, how do you disappear? Um, I always tell people to ignore me, and that doesn't work normally, but I, I always tell them to ignore me. But I think you disappear by... Um, asking a lot of questions first, not picking up your camera right away, listening, and um, looking people in the eye, making sure that they see that you are open and that you're available and that you're there, you know, with the best of intentions. Um, and I think I do tell them, I think I tell them, I'm here to, you know, tell your story. Uh, and this is the key. This is really the key. I spend a lot of time with people. So I don't just spend an hour or two. I spend days with them. You know, it doesn't always work out because sometimes the subject is really delicate, like with the Los Angeles story. But I spent as much, as many hours as I could with her as she would let me, you know. Um, that's really how you disappear. You put in your time. Because there's a lot of pictures in the first part, you know, you're, you're not making great pictures that first day or the first five hours or however many. Um, but then they start to get used to it. And like in the same sense, when these cameras turned on, we were like, whoa, my God. And then we kind of chilled out. I kind of, you know, feel okay now. <laughs> but you know what I mean? You know, we got, we're, we're now used to it. And um, now we're t just, you and I, all of us here are connecting. They're hopefully connecting. Um, I think that's how you disappear, you know? You make yourself available, you listen, and you, you're quiet, you know? I don't talk a lot. Uh, I ask a lot of questions here intermittently, but I don't like engage in terms of like, let me tell you about, oh my God, me, 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 no. I mean, when I'm behind the camera, the most important person is the person on the other side of the camera. That's the other way that you really disappear, is you make it about them, 100%. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Cool. So, yeah. I just had one thing, Penny. Yeah. It's, it sort of sounds like what you're saying is, I think when you first go in to photograph someone, they feel kind of vulnerable. Yeah, um, absolutely. So I think what you're doing is showing them that you're also vulnerable. Yeah. And once they see that, that's when you can get photos yeah. like this. Yeah, absolutely. It's that, you know, humility and vulnerability and all those things that you guys did in your videos, you know? put yourselves out there. It's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a story. So again, this is a, this is, this is a food story. I w was sent to Idaho to do a story on this lamb rancher. Um, and I spent like three or four days with him. And literally, every day, I was like, so where are the no, it was sheep? sheep? Where are the sheep herders? And he was like, oh, they're up in the mountains. And I was like, uh, can we go hang out with them? <laughs> um, you know, and I just was like, man. So I spent a lot of my time in the field getting access, even though I already have access. Like, people think, oh, you're here to take my picture. OK. And then they just <laughs> kind of do something, and then that's it. Like, I, 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 I'm constantly educating people about my process and the way that I make photographs. Um, so finally, after two and a half to three days, the rancher said, oh, you want to photograph them? And I was like, dude, I've been saying that for three days. Um, so he was like, okay, they're going to be moving the sheep across the pass, um, you know, tomorrow morning at like 5 a.m. And I was like, oh, thank God, you know, I was, yes, you know, I'm there. So of course, I'm, and the writer was with me, um, and I was like, we're getting up, we're getting up at four, because I don't want to miss this, and we're going to be there by like 4.15 or something. So, uh, so we get there, and, um, and this, the light hadn't even started to come out. They're moving 3,000 animals you know, to another pass. Um, and so of course, I start shooting. I get in the back of the truck, and these are the sheep herding dogs. And so this just beautiful light comes in, and 
I, this didn't run in the magazine, you know? I didn't need to make this picture, but I saw, it was, it was for me, it was like, oh, that's, I'm like kind of going around the entire truck, and I ran up, and I have, I have, I have a handful of these that I normally show, but I wanted to give you guys kind of just a condensed version. This is actually a photograph I made um, when I was working on my uh, Texas-Mexico project, the Borderlands. And so this is, to me, foreshadowing. Because I wasn't shooting food at this point, but you know what I realized is that I've been shooting food for like 10 years. <laughs> All of my assignments started in the kitchen. Where's the first place people invite you in to their home? Can I offer you something to drink, something to eat? Please come in. And you go into the kitchen, you sit down, and that's where the first conversation is. Normally, especially in Latin America, they're always going to try to feed you. Um, I've been shooting food for a long time, so this was like a natural progression for me. This is in a flea market. They call them pulgas um, along the border. And, uh, you know, I just love that this family, like, put all these grapefruits in the back of their truck to sell them. You know, that's how they displayed them. Yes. This, uh, I will talk about this assignment uh, a couple of times, but this is a story I did in Lebanon, in Beirut. Um, uh, and this is at a market that I went to. I went, I, they sent me on assignment to Beirut during Ramadan for a food story. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Dog. <laughs> I was like, okay, guys, they only eat once and it's at night. Uh, I don't know how to get great light in that one. Um, so anyway, but this is a market during the day. So I wasn't happy with the photos I'd made. And so I asked my fixer if we could, you know, spend a few days just going to markets and outlying areas. And so we did. Um, and I'm really, really glad because then I felt better about the material I was getting. So when I go on an assignment, that's it. Like you're there for that amount of time, and then you gotta get back because you. I have a budget. I have to honor that budget. You know, I have to be responsible with the money I spend, which is their money, um, the magazine's money. So, um, so yeah, that's this picture. So again, I just, uh, I, I feel like the similarities between this one and the grapefruit shot, you know, with the trunk and the trunk. I mean, they're just that theme has been in my body of work for years. Do, are there any questions? I can take some questions right now. All right, let's do some questions. Um, let's see here. I mean, I guess people are just really interested in how, how you're getting into all these places. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if it's really the logistics of that or um, you know, how you're getting into these people's lives and how, how I guess, the, the job put you directly in there? Is that you're just doing that all on your, on your own? Like, uh, Yes and no. It depends on the assignment. Um, usually, uh, <clears throat> usually a lot of that has been predetermined. Like when I was in Beirut, I knew I was going to be photographing this group of men. So that was already made. But, but access can be very fragile. So you can lose access and then, you, and then you're really screwed. And then you have to find a follow-up idea or figure out some way to pull it back together. So a lot of them, uh, the story has kind of been solidified. So I've got parameters that I'm working around. Um, I'm trying to think of an example of a story where it didn't work out or where the parameters are really. I just went to Honduras on an assignment. And uh, I knew the subject. Uh, I knew I was go where I was going. And so all of that was pretty much set up. So typically, they're set up. But there is the off chance that that access gets totally um, negotiated and falls through, and, and then I'm having to scramble to. But I also, uh, you know, when I'm sent to a location, I'm not just, um, I don't just go to that place and focus on that one story. So I'm always going to markets. That's like, that's a done deal. Like, that is the first thing I do is I go to a market. It's like, for me, that you really can feel the heartbeat of a community based on their market, especially in a, de in a developing country. Um, you get a feel right away for how that place is in, in relation to food. So think about all the best markets in the world. And the, the food is usually pretty fantastic. India, Mexico, all of Latin America. I mean, it's the hub of the culture. Yeah, it is. The culture happens in markets, and they're great great places to make photographs. That is not the case in this country, in my opinion. I feel like markets 
in the US are a bit cliche, and they are hard places to make photographs that are original and different and um, evocative, you know? Our markets are a little too clean and nice. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I hope I answered that. Yeah, in the Beirut, um, did you have a guide that was taking you? I did. Okay. I had a, I'm trying to think if I had, I, I, I always, if I can, if it's not a language I speak, I always have a guide and or a fixer. Okay. Um, and a driver, perhaps? Yeah, definitely okay. a driver if, okay. if I need it. Um, so yeah, in Beirut, I had a fixer and a translator, yeah.